Okay, welcome. We are um, very pleased to be offering this Polar Connect event to you today. Um, we're going to be talking with Dr. Jennifer Burns, who's actually down in Antarctica and already working on her uh, field project, which is what we're going to hear about. Um, this webinar is part of our professional development online course that we offer through the Polar Trek program. And uh, Sarah and I are happy to be hosting it for you, and we're glad that you are all able to join us. Um, we also have several members of Dr. Burns' team, including Alex Eilers, who was a teacher that went down with her last year, um, on hand to help uh, answer questions and um, just kind of be back up and, and make sure things run smoothly with the presentation. Before we turn it over to Dr. Burns, we have a few things that we want to tell you about uh, the platform that we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. And the slides should be changing for you in the center of your screen. Um, the only person that will be having video today is Dr. Burns herself. Um, we turned everybody else's video off, so we'll just see her, her head down there at McMurdo. And, um, um, but some other features are, you can see a list of participants that have joined us today as well as there is a chat room. And this is, we use the chat room to introduce yourselves as well as uh, post questions and um, troubleshoot any technical difficulties as we go along. So feel free to type away in the chat room and uh, say hi and tell us where you're all from and maybe why you joined this course and this webinar, why it's of interest to you. Uh, one thing uh, you should know is that we are archiving this, so if for some reason you have to leave early today or um, something happens, we'll post the archive both on our Polar Trek website and if you're in the course, we'll actually have the link also in the course um, so you can access it later on. And if you are using a phone um, you and the computer, you'll uh, need to mute your phone so you don't walk on top of uh, Jennifer while she's talking. You can do that by star six um, to mute it and star six to unmute it. And I think that's it for right now. Um, we have a new slide up that says participant introduction, so please type in where you are. Um, and if you do have any students by chance joining today who's with you, um, and then I think since you're part of, many of you are joined because of the course, you know, why it is you're interested in this particular subject, that would be nice to hear from you. And with that, I think we're going to turn it over um, to Dr. Burns, and we have your first slide up, and then we'll let you uh, take control. Welcome. Well, thanks, Janet and Sarah, for uh, getting this set up. It seems uh, kind of remarkable to me that uh, I can be down here in the Antarctic and talking to teachers from Italy and Portugal and Alaska and, and everywhere else. Um, so th thank everybody for, for participating and joining in and being willing to spend an hour of your afternoon or evening uh, uh, learning about Weddell Seals. It is our morning here. It's just coming on 8 o'clock. Um, and for us, it is Friday morning. I think a lot of you, it's still Thursday back in the States. Uh, got up this morning, and it was minus 2 degrees Fahrenheit with about a wind about 20 knots. So our wind chill takes us down to about minus 30. Um, so it's nice to be inside for the morning rather than being outside um, uh, trying to catch seals. Although we will likely go out again uh, later this afternoon to try and locate our seals. So let's tell you where we are. The um, slide that's up shows you uh, the range of where you can find Weddell seals in the Antarctic. Weddell seals are species that are only found in the Antarctic. Um, and they are found all around the continent of the, of the, all around the continent where they like to be in fast ice, which is the ice that's attached to land um, so they can haul out a like the seal in the top picture. Um, specifically, I am and our research team are down at McMurdo Station, and McMurdo Station is right here in the uh, at the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf, which is this area right there. And I usually think of the uh, Antarctic uh, in this perspective, where here's South Pole and we're here's uh, McMurdo Station. Um, Right at the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf where McMurdo Station is located is an island called Ross Island. And 
Uh, it has been used as a base for the Antarctic exploration uh, for more than a hundred years. And part of that reason for that long use is that the uh, Erebus Bay, which is this water mass right here, is the furthest south open water in uh, the middle of the summer around the entire continent. So there were uh, when Scott and Shackleton and everybody was racing for uh, the South Pole, uh, leaving from Ross Island um, got you the longest start into the pole. So that was uh, why this station originally came to be or why this base originally came to be. And the U.S. has been running this base since uh, the 1950s. Historically, it's been run by the military and is now uh, run by private contractors and the National Science Foundation. So conveniently for SEAL researchers like myself and our team, there is a large population of Weddell seals in the area on the fast ice um, around McMurdo Station, which makes it very easy for us to live in a, in a research base where we have showers and coffee in the morning and dorm rooms. And uh, we can take snow machines out to find the seals. And Waddle seals like the three in this picture. This is a this is a adult Waddle seal looking at us. Um, in the background, you see Mount Erebus, which is a very dominant uh, volcanic feature. It steams and ashes occasionally. Um, and this is a Waddle seal colony. You can see the seals lying on what looks like ground, but that's actually fast ice. There's water underneath there. The ice is about uh, three meters thick at this time of the year. So it's very, very safe for us to travel on, and the seals like it because it doesn't move and it's a very stable platform. <clears throat> Since there has been uh, research on seals in McMurdo Station for a long time, um, one of the neat things that's happened down here is there's been a long-term tagging study. So here you can see an adult wattle seal with flipper tags, and these little flipper tags are individually numbered. So each animal has its own identity, um, and we can look it up in the database and um, see when the animal was born, how many pups it has, um, who its mom was, all sorts of information like that. And that makes it really helpful for all of us who want to ask questions about things like, well, how does age affect uh, behavior? Or how does sex affect behavior? How does reproductive status affect behavior? So there's been a long-term study, and that helps us know lots about the seals. And here again is a colony of seals around a crack in the fast ice. So here we've got ice that's floating on seawater. And the seals need to eat, and they go into the water most days to get some food. Um, and they use this crack in the sea ice um, between to get in and out of the water. So they just dive right through that little slushy spot and, and get wet. And here's an underwater picture. You can see the crack in a seal in what we call breathing holes. Seals come into these colonies in order to give birth to their pups um, in mid-October to early November. So right now we're in peak pupping season. And there's a science team down here that's studying pupping and reproduction. And they have found um, so far that they're They've already tagged more than 400 pups that have been born this year. So it's been a very, very good year so far. Pups, when they're born, weigh about 25 kilos or about 50 pounds. So they're very large relative to um, what I would like to think of having born. Um, but the moms are also really big. The moms are 400 uh, to 500 kilograms, so, so big, large animal. And at the end of the lactation period, mom nurses her pups for about six weeks, five to six weeks. And the pup gains several kilos a day. Um, and so the pup gets very fat, and the mom gets very skinny over that time period. So you can see there in those photos a pup when it's born and a pup when it is just about ready to be weaned. The other things that the seals do during the summer months is that they have to grow themselves a new fur coat. Every year, uh, Weddell seals shed their old fur and grow their new fur. So here uh, is a seal, the lower image here is a seal that is in its old fur coat. It's been swimming around in the ocean uh, for the last year, and the fur is kind of brown and raggedy looking. 
Um, and it's time for the seal to get rid of that. Um, so it sheds just like your dog would shed or many animals do. And when the animal finishes shedding, it's in a very beautiful silver and black fur coat. And when Alex was down here with us in January, we were looking very closely at the seals and the color of their fur because we were trying to find seals that had already molted into their new coat. And this is because, as you'll see, we are uh, attaching tags to the animals uh, that allow us to track them. And we attach those tags with glue onto the fur. And if we attached the tags to the old brown fur, then the tags would fall off when that fur was shed. So we had to wait until the animals got their new fur coat um, in order to attach uh, the tags. So if we look at kind of the life of a Weddell seal um, in what they're doing is uh, if you start kind of midwinter, which down here is in July, the animals are foraging at sea, um, gaining mass over the winter. Uh, and swimming around. And then they come into the colonies in early October in order to give birth to their pups. And they nurse their pups for about five weeks and breed. Males uh, find females and breed. And then they shed their new fur coat, shed their old fur, grow their new fur. Um, and that's a process called molt. And when they're done with that, they go back out into the ocean and feed for a long period of time. So really, they have kind of a two-phase lifespan, where, lifestyle, where they spend nine months out of the year, or eight, eight to nine months out of the year, actively foraging, and uh, three to four months out of the year, looking a lot more like a couch potato, um, lying around on the sea ice. When they are diving, uh, we know quite a bit about what they do. Um, there have been studies on the diving behavior of um, Weddell seals since the early 1980s when the first technology came aboard. And this actually is a picture of one of the first uh, recorders. This is a time depth recorder. And it collected data like that, which is shown on the bottom panel. Um, and it recorded the depth of every single dive that that animal made for about a 15-day period. And that was all the computer memory could hold. Um, and you had to get the tag back from the animal. And if you think this is about a 500 kilo animal, so it's very large. And that tag was at least as big as your computer. And now an equivalent device that exists is smaller than a matchbook and can hold the information for up to a year of behavior. So the, the technology has really come a long way. What we know about diving from those kinds of studies is that the animals can routinely, regularly hold their breath for 20 minutes or more. And they can routinely dive to 700 meters in depth or maybe even deeper than that. Um, and so that's, that's quite impressive. This is an air-breathing mammal. And in parallel with studies of diving behavior of Weddell seals, so how deep and how long they're diving, have been studies of diving physiology, which is asking the question, well, how, long, how in the world are they able to stay down, hold their breath for so long? And what we know from past studies that I've conducted and that others in the research team have conducted is that one of the ways that Weddell seals are able to stay down for so long is that they have very, very large oxygen stores. They essentially dive with their own scuba tank. And they have oxygen in their lungs. And they have oxygen in their blood. They have lots and lots of oxygen in their blood. Their blood is very, very dark red. Um, and they have lots of hemoglobin in the blood cells. And then their muscles are loaded with an oxygen-carrying pigment called myoglobin, which makes their muscles look almost black. So they carry lots and lots of oxygen down with them when they dive. And then they're really good at managing those oxygen stores while they're diving. They don't just flail around in the water like some of us do in the swimming pool. They are very efficient swimmers. You can see they're kind of torpedo-shaped. So this looks like a nice little torpedo with just a little flipper out there for steering. And when they're diving, 
they don't swim, they don't use their energy, use their muscles continuously. They stroke a couple of times with their hind flippers and then they glide some. And then they stroke a couple times with their hind flippers and then they glide some. And I'm going to try and get uh, some underwater video uh, of Weddell seals swimming under the ice from one of the, the research teams down here. And we'll be trying to get that to, to Sarah so she can post it um, on, on the Polar Trek site. But it's too big for me to send it out through um, the data link here. So we've got to figure out a way to get it, get it out to you guys so you can see that. We also know a lot about what Weddell seals eat uh, in the area. They're very happy to swim around in ice-covered and cold waters. And uh, when they're in the water, they're catching a variety of different fish species. Some of them are small, like this silverfish, which is kind of similar to our herring or sardine. Others are much larger. This is a Antarctic cod. Uh, and that fish in this picture is probably about 50 pounds. Um, and so a seal may chew on an arctic cod for dinner for two or three days. There are also some other fish species. This is an image that one of our research team members took uh, last season, a uh, seal in a hole um, from Kim. And we don't know what species of fish that is. Um, so they eat a whole variety of different things. So what I've just said is that we kind of know a lot about weddell seals. Um, and what our research team was interested in was the question of how, what those seals do in the wintertime. We know a lot about what they do in the summer because McMurdo Station, the base where we're at right now, is open um, and populated all summer. Currently on station there are 1,007 people, of which 27% are female and 73% are male. That's the kind of normal ratio down here. Um, and then in February, towards the end of February, when the base closes and when Alex and our team left last year, the base population drops to about 150 people. And there are not many scientists here through the winter. So we don't know as much about what Weddell seals do in the long, dark Antarctic winter. And that was one of the focuses of the research study um, that we've been down here to work on. And there are a lot of changes in Antarctica between summer and winter. Uh, our base, remember, is right here in the open water uh, in February when um, <coughs> uh, at the end of summer. And in this image, the dark blue is the sea ice around the continent at the end of summer. And in the middle of winter, uh, this picture from September, um, so you can see that the sea ice is much, much more extensive. And from the perspective of a seal, those changes mean that their access to air to breathe and their access to ice to haul out on changes quite dramatically. This is a seal swimming right outside of McMurdo Station um, in January when the ice was very, uh, had retreated quite a bit. Um, this is a Weddell seal uh, in the study area in uh, October. Uh, kind of at the start of the spring when there's still a lot of ice around. Um, and you can see that their access to air and water is, is very different. And this is a picture of uh, the Ross, the McMurdo Sound right out here um, at the absolute beginning. This is in a picture from August. This is the end of winter. And this is the kind of access that seals have to air. They maintain breathing holes and uh, holes in the ice for them to get in and out. So their environment changes quite a bit. And we were interested in how seals dealt with those environmental changes. And then there are also other long-term ongoing changes in the ecosystem that may be impacting the seals that we wanted to understand. Um, and one of those, as, as many of you have commented on, you, you're interested in climate change issues. Um, as we know, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic are warming uh, fairly quickly. The Ross Sea is actually an interesting area down here. There has not yet been much signal of climate warming uh, in the Ross Sea. So from that perspective, we don't have a large impact, although it's likely to change in the future. But we do have a potentially fairly large impact um, starting in the Ross Sea is that there's been fishing 
uh, in the Ross Sea for uh, the large Antarctic toothfish, which is a favored prey item of Weddell seals. Um, it was that really big fish I showed in an image earlier. And uh, the impact of fishing on the uh, commercial fishing on the, the cod population is of concern to a lot of scientists. Um, and there's been a, a push to make parts of the Ross Sea uh, a marine reserve in order to protect it uh, from those effects. Because a big Antarctic cod uh, may be decades um, old when it's fished, if not uh, you know, 50 to 70 years old. OK, so we have all this going on. And we were going to study, our project's going to focus on using seals, studying seals in the winter in order to understand both the oceanographic climate, so temperature and things like that, and the seal behavior. And to do that, we have a really big research team. Um, we have a group from the University of California at Santa Cruz. It's led by uh, Dr. Daniel Costa and his graduate student, Kim Getz. And they're looking at foraging behavior and habitat utilization, so where, where the seals go, uh, what they eat, um, and what types of habitat they like. We have um, my team, which is led by myself, Jennifer Burns, and I have two grad students involved in this project, uh, Linnea Pearson and Michelle Ciro, who are both online answering questions as they come up, because I can't walk and talk at the same time, or type and talk at the same time. And we're looking at foraging behavior and, um, and diving behavior and physiological condition and how those, how what they do in the environment is related to how much mass they gain and how much fat they have and how long they can hold their breath. And then we have a research team um, led by Drs. Eileen Hoffman and John Clank from the Old Dominion University who are using some of the information we're collecting to develop models of the oceanographic conditions, the current patterns, the temperature, the heat budget of the Ross Sea itself in, in oceanographic models. Um, so we have kind of a, a very diverse group of people working on this project. And what we're doing is we are letting the animals collect the data for us. Um, this is one of our Weddell seals, and you can see it's got something funny stuck to the top of its head. This is a uh, satellite tag, and this computerized device collects lots and lots of different information while the seal is swimming around in its environment. So if we look at this tag, it weighs about a pound. Um, and it collects information on behavior, so it, it monitors how long the seal is diving, what depths it's at. Um, it also knows whether it's dry or wet, so whether the seal's in the water or dive, hauled out. Um, it measures water temperature, and it measures water salinity. Um, so it tells us how salty the water is, what temperature it is, how deep it is. And it collects all that information, and it stores it in uh, computerized memory and does a lot of processing of the data before it sends the information out through its antenna, which is this thing right here, to a satellite system called the Argo Satellite System. And the Argo Satellite System then transmits the data that it receives back to us in our home institutions. So we will leave uh, Antarctica after putting the tags out in January and February and we will obtain data on where the seals are going and what they're doing for the next uh, six to eight months. And then we're down here right now looking for the seals that are carrying these instruments so that we can get the tags back. And if we get the tags back, we get every little bit of information that the, the tags collected over the entire time the seal is out in its environment. And we get it at really high resolution. So it gives us a fabulous data set. Whereas what we get when it's transmitted is a much smaller data set. So over the three years of this project, we have put tags out on 22 seals in 2010, 20 in 2011, and 21 in 2012. So 63 wild seals over the three years of the study got outfitted with these satellite tags on their heads. And we put them out around the McMurdo Station. So station is right down here at the blue um, blue star and every star um, along the coastline of Ross Island. 
and up the coastline uh, in this area has uh, where we put uh, satellite tags out on the animals. So I thought before we uh, show you some of the data, I thought I'd show you how we do this because it's kind of fun to think about how to catch a wild animal and put a tag on its head like that guy there. So here's a little primer course on, on how to tag a seal. So the first thing we do is we have to find a group of seals. And in this project, we use a variety of different ways to, to locate seals and to get access to them. We travel locally uh, in the area on snow machines. So we drive around um, on the sea ice looking for seals. Um, if we want to go a little further away, we either um, we often use uh, helicopters, like uh, the Bell. Uh, that's an A star uh, on the lower left hand uh, side of that slide. If we want to get an idea of where seals are over a much larger area, we often fly in lar in um, twin otter aircraft, which is the upper right. Um, and we can't land that aircraft very many locations because it needs a runway, but it does allow us to figure out where seals are in the overall Rossi area. And then the bottom right picture is uh, the field team uh, inside of one of the larger helicopters. Um, and for people who are well, reading the comments, the person in the front of that picture is Linnea Pearson, I'm one of my grad students. So after we find a suitable seal, um, and they do let us just kind of walk up to them, they don't think of us as predators um, because there are no terrestrial predators down here. There are no polar bears in the Antarctic except for the stuffed fuzzy variety that people have for, for their kids and, and plush toys. Um, we walk up, we look at, at the seals, we look for a suitably molted seal, not the brown guys, but the shiny black guys. And if we find one of those, we uh, go and get the gear that we need to, uh, to work on the animal. And we, we actually have quite a bit of gear, as you can see in the sled there. Um, and this allows us to do all of the procedures uh, that we need to do in order to get the animal tagged and to measure its physiology. <coughs> So these are, are animals that allow us to walk up to them, but they are wild animals and they do weigh quite a bit. So in order to uh, work on them safely, we need to drug them. Um, and to do that, we give them an uh, injection of a sedative, which is what's happening in the upper right hand uh, photo there. And the seals usually don't react very much. And then um, we wait for that sedative to take effect. Um, and the seal then goes to sleep and we're able, after the seal is asleep, uh, we're able to put a net on it to keep it restrained uh, after it wakes up. Um, and that's what's happening in the lower, bottom, lower right hand photo. Once the seal is asleep and we're able to start working on it, we give the seal in a health assessment exam. We take, uh, just like if you went to the doctor, uh, we measure the seal's length, how fat it is, a measure a series of, of uh, girth measurements, and then we use an ultrasound measure, an ultrasound probe, in order to determine how fat the animal is. Um, seals are little animals that are wrapped in a big blubber coat, a big Where coat of fat. And just uh, lost you maybe for a second. We couldn't hear you, so I did just stop you. Sorry about that. Um, could I just want to know in the chat box, could everybody continue hearing her? OK, great. Sorry to interrupt everybody. We may have lost people on the phone. So we'll redial the phone while you're talking again. OK. Alex, are you still on the phone? Can you, you are still on the phone. We'll dial right back in. Um, and we will let Jennifer start talking again right now. Go ahead, Jennifer. Sorry about that. Our 
Okay. Jennifer, please te um, just press the talk button and then we'll hear you. Ah, there we go. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Great, we're all okay, back. so one of the things we're interested in, yay, we're all back. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the things we're interested in uh, in the study is how fat animals are, because fat is a good thing for a seal. Um, seals have a large blubber layer. This fat layer you can kind of see in this cross-section image, which comes out of a very old textbook. This isn't something that we did. Um, this is uh, the little inner seal wrapped in a thick blubber coat, and that coat helps them stay warm, it provides energy, um, and it makes them very streamlined to swim through the water. So we measure the seal and we, we determine how much fat it has so that we can say whether the animals are gaining or losing mass over the winter time. And then we weigh the seal and to do that we put it in a sling and we, we lift it up in the air. We have a scale sitting up top here, um, it's called a load cell. And um, so here we are weighing the animal. So we have essentially an entire veterinary exam uh, that we give the animal. We collect blood samples and tissue samples so that we can determine diet and, and health and all sorts of things like that. So that's our part of the project. And then um, we're attaching the satellite tag to the head of the animal using uh, a, and a glue called a five-minute epoxy. Um, and I like to say that this is a $6,000 or $7,000 instrument that we have attached to the head of the seal using about $3 worth of glue. So having the seal's fur be properly molted and grown in so that the glue sets up well on the fur and the fur stays attached to the seal for a long time is really important. So once we uh, get that little head tag glued on the seal, um, we are essentially done with uh, our handling of the animal for the period. So we double check the data notebook, make sure we have recorded all the information that we need, um, make sure that this, the seal is doing well. This is Alex um, holding the head of a seal um, while the animal is drugged. It's not going to bite her because it's still asleep. Um, and then we release the seal back into the environment and it just goes and does its own thing for the next nine months. Um, <coughs> so we like to stay around and wait until we see that the animal is moving and, and you know, awake out of all of its sedatives and usually they go right into the water because, well, I think the water looks very cold to get into. Seals seem to feel very safe once they're in the water. Then we pack up and we go home, get in the helicopter, get back on our snow machines, um, and wait for the tag to start talking to us. Um, and then what we do is we come back down, and this is, this is what we're doing down here right now. In addition to the tag on the seal's head, we've put a small radio tag on the back of the animal. And these tags uh, just beep. Every second they make a noise and we can receive that with antennas that um, are either handheld as in that small photo or attached to a helicopter in the photo behind that. And we, that allows us to relocate our seals um, in the area so that we can recover the satellite tag. And that's what we're down here doing right now. And what we find out is that, what we found when we find our animals again is that a seal that was carrying a very pretty, nicely attached, uh, intact tag in February when we released it, a lot of the times we find them uh, now, October, November, on the sea ice with their satellite tag still attached, um, but the tag, the satellite tag is missing its antenna. Um, and this is because the seal's been swimming around through ice-covered waters for the last nine months, and that, ta that antenna gets worn off. Um, but this, the, carrying the tag doesn't hurt the seal, 
Um, and one of the ways we know that is seals that we catch in October, November are usually bigger than they were when we handled them in January. And most of the females give birth to a pup. So there, there you can see a female from our study um, and her pup that she's given birth to. So that indicates to us that the seal was uh, happy and healthy, it was able to uh, get pregnant and gestate its pup and give birth and, and all that. But the fact that the, sea, the tag has lost its antenna means it can't transmit the information back to us anymore. So getting the tag back so we can download it as if it's a little computer um, is really important. And, well, before I and so far this season, we have recovered five of the tags that we put out um, last year. And we have seen two, three other, two other, uh, sorry, two other seals um, that we haven't yet uh, recovered tags from um, or that have lost their tags, uh, but that uh, we will we'll still work up. So we've been down here for a little more than a week, and we've been very, very successful so far at recovering instruments. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about the data that we're getting. Um, this, these are track lines. That the ta this is the movement patterns of the seals um, that we're obtaining from the tags, um, both in 2010 and 2011. Um, the seals are tagged where these little stars are, back here along the coastline. Um, and you can see that they are covering, they're moving across the course of the year over a large area of um, the Ross Sea. They, they're traveling more than 500 kilometers from where they're tagged, they, and then they come back into the same area. Um, Kim Getz's work is taking those spaghetti plots and um, turning them into maps of where the animals spend a lot of time. So here's kind of a, a different image of the same region. And the red in this image is uh, where, the seal, where a lot of the seals spent a lot of their time. So you can see that in the overall area, there are parts of the ocean that are preferred by the animals over other parts. And we are working to figure out what it is about those areas that makes them so attractive to the seals. And one of the things that we think that makes those particular areas really attractive to the seals is properties of the water itself. That those areas that the seals spend a lot of time in have warmer water in it, in them, and that warmer water is coming from off the shelf. And um, in this picture, the red dots are seal locations, and the different colors are water, um, are percentages of a deep water mass called the circumpolar deep water. Um, and Sarah has posted online um, on, a, on this website some animations of the seals moving through the habitat and the water patterns, the water current flows moving through the habitat. So you can find that on the Polotrek site um, and, we, in, and look at it there. We can't show it um, in this uh, collaborate setting, unfortunately. We also um, know, because we know where the seals are when they're diving, we know how deep the seafloor is and we can figure out whether the seals are diving to the seafloor, so whether they're diving all the way down to the bottom, or whether they're diving, um, staying in the midwater habitat. And for the most part, the seals are diving much shallower than the seafloor, although at times they do um, hit the bottom. And knowing that gives us an idea of whether they're eating fish that live along the bottom, or benthic species, or whether they're eating fish that are swimming in the midwater environment. And for the most part, it looks like our seals prefer the midwater fish species in the area. Um, we also, because we have all this physiology data, we're able to um, correlate how long and how deep the animals go um, with information on their body mass. And um, we're, we know that the bigger the animal is, the longer it can stay down. And um, this allows lo larger animals 
um, a greater chance to catch fish in the environment because they can hold their breath longer and stay down and search for longer. So size matters in this, this case. And as animals get bigger over the year, um, they can access more and different prey resources. And with that, I'm going to wrap up and leave us some time to answer questions that you have. I see that the little chat box has um, been going uh, throughout the seminar. And um, now I can answer any oral questions uh, that people have. I'll leave it on. So are you, does anybody have questions? Go ahead. Hi, Jen. Um, thanks for your um, presentation. So for questions, if you do want to ask a question live, that's great, and we encourage you to do so. Click on the little hand icon above the list of participants. And uh, yeah, for those of you that haven't figured it out, there's a little hand icon, and that lets you let us know, and we'll call on you. When you get uh, ready here, we need you to click on your talk button once to open up the mic and um, ask your question, and then unclick it when you are done, and then Jen can answer your question. So let's go to Julia. My question was just um, about the 73% male. You said 73% male ratio, and I think I was just wondering um, why and what happens to the females. Thanks. Did you get that, Jen? Then press your talk button when you're ready. You, we are hearing you, Jen. So you um, that, what I meant there was button. that the human population. OK, that's funny. Perfect. OK, Bruce, do you have a question? Go ahead. Bruce, you, we don't see you. We saw your mic pressing there for a moment. Remember, click on it once to open up the mic and click on it a second time. Okay, Bruce, it looks like you're working on your microphone there, maybe. Um, maybe we can jump down to Lisa while Bruce is trying things out. Lisa, press the talk button to speak and let it and press it again when you're done. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. All right, well, uh, perhaps not. And uh, anybody else have a question? Go ahead. Okay, um, some of you are having microphone issues, so um, we're going to move on. There was, uh, so Jennifer, you answered uh, Patricia's question. Thank you very much. Um, Julia, do you have another question? Do you want to ask live? Actually, I didn't. I forgot to unclick the thing, but I do actually just came up with one. Um, as far as you say, there's not a lot of climate change happening there in the Ross Sea, but um, have you noticed differences in the, just in the past few years in their foraging during the course of the winter? Jen, you need to press the talk button so we can okay. hear you. Yeah, I think I got the talk button pressed. Um, they, we have 
not noticed a lot of difference over the past three years or among the three years in in the foraging behavior. Um, one of the things we are looking at is differences in behavior now as compared to some uh, limited data we have from the 19, early 1990s. Um, and, and we are seeing some differences in the behavior between the 1990s and the 2010 uh, regimes. But the, it, it's difficult to assess very precisely because 20 years ago, the instruments weighed four times as much as they do now and collected about 10% of the data that they do now. So uh, we can make some limited comparisons, uh, but it, it's hard to do do uh, over the longer term, it, what we have been able to see suggests that the animals are foraging differently now than they were in the past, perhaps because of uh, changes in the prey base uh, in the fish stocks in the region and the largest kind of climate or environmental difference that has happened between 1990s and now is that in the 1990s there was no commercial fishing in the Ross Sea, um, and now there is. Okay, and uh, there was a there was a question that came up, um, and it says, "Can you tell uh, me more about the ODU collaborat collaborators are looking at, and are the mathematical models they are working?" Yeah, our colleagues uh, at ODU are using the data that we are collecting in very complex mathematical models. Um, they're called regional oceanographic models or ROMS models um, that predict uh, changes in temp ocean temperature and um, predict current patterns and the movement of water masses based on a whole lot of things that I don't understand, um, which is why you have collaborators because they can do things that you can't. Uh, what the way they're doing this is not they have a model of what the Ross Sea oceanography um, should be, where the currents are moving, how how it changes seasonally, and they are using the data that we are getting from the seals to uh, provide ground truthing for that model. So. The oceanography model is not developed from the seal data, but is truthed with the seal data. So it's kind of refined based on what the seals are giving us as reality. Great. We see lots of people typing, so we'll see if other questions are coming in. Um, we have a live, or Patricia wants to ask a question live, so we'll go to Patricia. Mm. Go ahead, Patricia. She turned it off. She has no talk. We'll see if we get Patricia. Patricia, can you, uh, it looks like you're working on your wizard there, having microphone issues? Maybe so. Okay. Well, why don't you type your question in, because we are not hearing you at all. And Jennifer, you're welcome to press your talk button and answer the questions in the chat box. All right. I'll, I'll try and get a couple of these. These questions answered. Um, do the easy one first. Um, I have first came down to the Antarctic in 1991 as a graduate student, um, and this is my ninth season doing research in the Antarctic um, over the last 20 or so years. Um, so on and off uh, for a good while now. Um, I also do work in the Arctic 
and in the West and Pacific off California, Washington, and Oregon. Um, we, I, my original work down here was on Weddell seal diving behavior uh, 20 years ago. Um, so we're kind of coming back to this question again now. And um, we are hoping to be back down in, uh, in the next couple of years to look at um, reproduction and molt timing and how those two events are influenced by animal condition and hormones. So to try and figure out how, what controls when pupping and when molting happens. Um, okay, so we are still trying to do that. Um, to answer an earlier question about fishing, um, the research in Antarctica is governed uh, by uh, the Antarctic Conservation Act and the Antarctic Treaty. Um, and that is a international agreement that's been signed off on by uh, lots of uh, countries. It governs issues of research extraction and military presence and impact on the continent itself. Um, it has less to do with regulations in the surrounding waters. Um, and so there, the waters surrounding uh, Antarctica are international waters. They're not uh, governed by any particular country. And so at some level, they are open to uh, all countries. And there is both um, commercial fishing in Antarctic waters in a wide variety of regions. And there is commercial, well, sorry, it's not called commercial whaling. There's scientific whaling um, in some areas, uh, particularly by the Japanese, as many of us will be aware of uh, through Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd type of uh, things. So um, there are, we are trying to develop um, CAMLAR, uh, Conservation and Antarctic Marine Living Resources Program is trying to develop conservation measures uh, for fish stocks and fish resources. So currently there are both uh, fisheries for, for fin fish and fisheries for krill and other species. Um, Okay, and let's see, the other question that I saw come past um, was a question about how seals find the breathing holes in the summer. Um, certainly very obvious, lots of light coming down through them. Um, in the winter, we still don't really understand how seals navigate um, under the ice or even um, how they find their prey underwater because uh, even in summertime, if the seals are deeper than 200 meters, which they are quite frequently when they're diving, there is no ambient light down there. Um, so we, we think that the seals are very um, good at detecting water movement. Um, they probably use their vibrissae um, or their whiskers to feel water movement. Um, but how seals or any marine mammal um, that doesn't have sonar uh, manages to find fish or prey in the complete darkness uh, remains one of the kind of mysteries of our field. So Jen, there was a question that came up in the middle of that about um, are you learning anything about climate change um, from the study or whether you expect to? Um, we are not directly addressing issues of climate change in this project. Um, the data we're collecting for the ROMS model, the oceanographic model, um, is kind of is being treated primarily as a here's what the raw sea is doing right now in this block of time. They're not looking so much at have things changed over this three-year period that we have the data for. Um, however, by collecting that information for the oceanography, we now do have baseline data against which to assess changes that might occur in the future. Um, and one of the biggest changes in quiet, or not climate, but one of the biggest environmental effects that's happened down here uh, recently has been uh, in the early 2000s, 
there were some very, very large icebergs that broke off and that blocked the Ross Sea or parts of the Ross Sea. And so the sea ice in the local area got very, very thick for a couple of years. Um, and that made it much more difficult for the seals to find breathing holes and to find cracks in the ice. And when those icebergs were in place, um, the seal population and the, and the penguin populations in the area uh, suffered quite a bit from that. Um, and we think that the seal population, a lot of the seals that traditionally came into um, McMurdo Sound didn't come this far south um, during the breeding years. Because a lot of the animals that weren't seen then have been seen since those icebergs uh, moved away. Um, and now the ice in the area is um, thinner than it thinner than it was in 2000, kind of back to its normal conditions for the area. Okay, and it looks like you got another question there, Jen, about the uh, seal milk and whether the snow petrels eat them or not, eat the snow. <laughs> Um, so we haven't, there, snow petrels are a rare sighting in McMurdo Sound. Um, we see them very infrequently. The most common bird that we see down here is the Antarctic skua, um, which is a scavenger. Um, and they eat the placentas and any other bits of um, seal things that they can um, get their beaks on. Um, so we haven't seen snow petrels eating snow saturated with seal milk, um, but I have seen um, Antarctic skuas eating just about every bit of a seal that you can think of. I think that uh, we are um, done, and uh, we uh, appreciate your time with uh, um, joining us from Antarctica there and everything. <laughs> There's lots of fun chat going on right now. Um, so we just wanted to uh, say thank you. And then for those of you that kind of joined midway, um, <laughs> this event will be archived. So um, you can, uh, you can, uh, Pick up where uh, you uh, you know pick up where you joined us yeah yeah where you joined us at uh, in a couple of days so um, anyway yeah thank you everybody for joining us and um, Jenny hope you have any questions yeah Jen have a uh, good rest of your field season down there and if you guys are um, part of the course or you're interested there's a webinar next week right with uh, with uh, Alex next Thursday I don't know if it's the same. Nope, not not the same time. Check out the website, uh, the Poetrek website, to get the right times and everything. And uh, just for uh, Justin, just so you know, Justin, the time change is this weekend in the U.S. So I think it's on Sunday. Times will be a change in here.